Last Saturday, members of the association were privy to a private security screening of the Paramount movie, Fire in the Sky. <coughs> of course, the movie is based on the experiences of a gentleman by the name of Travis Walton and his colleagues at the time. Certainly, one of the main characters in the film was a gentleman by the name of Mike Rogers. We are very pleased to announce that the two main gentlemen on whom the film is based are in with us tonight. The format of tonight's lecture will be a very brief rerun, if you like, of what the gentleman saw and experienced. I to give a, a big view for a welcome to Mr. Travis Walton and Mr. Mike Rogers. Thank you. Well, um, just I'll basically uh, run through it. You know, th this happened uh, November 5th, 1975. It was uh, nearly 18 years ago. There were seven of us. Uh, we just uh, finished a long, hard day's work in the woods in the uh, mountainous uh, forest region in Arizona. And uh, we uh, loaded our chainsaws in the back of uh, the crew truck there, double cab truck. So all seven of us were headed home. It was uh, starting to get dark. And as we were driving through the forest uh, on, the, on the way home, we saw a strange light coming through the tree. And uh, finally, uh, when we got further up, uh, we could see through a break in the trees uh, the source of the light. And we saw a large uh, glowing object coming from the sky near the road. Uh, Mike here was driving. He uh, stopped the truck. Somebody moved up to stop the truck. And as soon as he did, uh, I got out and started towards this thing. I was thinking that uh, it was just something that I was going to catch a glimpse of and it would be gone as quickly as I got up to it. But as I started towards it, the, the rest of the crew were, were, started screaming at me to get away from there and get back in the truck. And uh, I, I was scared too, but uh, I was curious. And, I can continue towards it, and uh, just as I got up closer to it, it the sound that it was making suddenly got more powerful, and uh, it started to rise up, and uh, that scared me. I jumped down behind the end of the log and was sticking up there trying to get some cover, and uh, I decided I'd you know, better get back and try to get away from that. And I raised up to go. And at that instant, uh, I felt something get hit me. It felt like I'd been hit by a truck. It was just uh, a really powerful jolt, like uh, an electric shock, mm -hmm. and I blacked out. What we saw was uh, like an energy beam, or, or it's been described as several things by the guys that were in the truck there uh, with me. But uh, it was like a, a straight-sided bolt of energy. It could have been like lightning, electricity. It could have been who knows what it was at the point. Uh, we tried to describe it, and I even painted a, a picture of it to, uh, to visualize it. But uh, whatever it was, it hit him with enough impact that it blew him back, knocked him back through the air, like uh, like as if a, a hand grenade or an explosion had gone off in front of him. And uh, he flew through the air there and, and landed on his back, uh, limp, you know, just like he was unconscious before he hit the ground. And uh, this whole thing was so frightening uh, to begin with that I had turned the truck back on right before that happened. And uh, when, when he was struck and, and hit the ground like that, I mean, it was, it was just panic. I just panicked, and the guys in the truck were, were panicked too because they were yelling at me to go just at the same time I was doing so on my own. And I hit the gas and, and we tore off down the road. And uh, it took me about a quarter of a mile uh, before I could get my thoughts together and, and uh, realize that we had left Travis back there. 
uh, and this led to, to his fate, I guess you'd say. Um, and I stopped the truck, and, and the group of us, not all of us, but most of us got out of the truck and had a very uh, excited, hectic uh, sort of discussion there. We could not explain what had just happened. Uh, and the whole thing was so frightening and, and unexplainable that our, our minds were just whirling. I mean, literally uh, couldn't, couldn't understand anything about it. Uh, but we did realize that we had left him back there and, and that we should go back. And, and just as we had made the decision to go ahead and return, uh, getting into the truck, we saw this uh, thing from a distance from a quarter mile away lift up through the trees and, and streak off to the northeast. And, you know, that made it certain to me that it was safe to go back. So we went back. Uh, and when we got back to the uh, site, we had a flashlight there in the glove box, and, and I gave it to Ken Peterson, who was there on my right, and he shone it around on that side of the truck, and I took it and shone it around on the left side. We were very cautious because we were still very, very afraid, even though we knew this thing left. I mean, we were so pumped, so so full of adrenaline and fear that, that I was nauseated. You know, I had white knuckles the only time in my life I ever experienced that. And uh, I took the light, and I, I shown it down there on, on the ground to see if there was any footprints in the road. And when I did, I saw the footprints where he had jumped out of the truck and, and his heel mark was very plain there in, in the dirt. And I got out of the truck and we started walking up there. And uh, I followed his footprints. And these guys all got out of the truck with me. And it was like, it was like six men, as tight as they could get in a little huddle. You know, here these guys this day would all been cutting trees, you know, big strong woodsmen. <laughs> and and uh, this thing had, had reduced us to that. But uh, we followed the footprints on up to where he had stood in the middle of this clearing and could not find the footprints anywhere where he had walked away from that. And uh, I checked very closely. And uh, from that, uh, we had deducted the he didn't leave the spot under his own power. They had taken him and <coughs> carried him off somewhere. And uh, from that point, once we realized that he wasn't there, and we did do a, a further search there around just to make sure. But uh, we then had to decide what to do next. And, and we got in the truck and decided we'd better go into town. My, my initial idea was that we should go in and get some other members of the family, some friends and people like that, get some, some more vehicles and some more lights and stuff and come back out immediately and, and make a larger search. And this was what I was discussing with the guys. And, and Ken Peterson was uh, the next oldest on the crew. And uh, he, his idea, he was what you call the, the good little Mormon boy. You know, He was such an honest guy that, that uh, uh, even, even withholding something to him was a form of lying. And so uh, he was very adamant about reporting it to the authorities right away in spite of the fact that I was saying, you know, they're not going to believe this. They're just not going to believe this. And, uh, and uh, the local sheriff, you might say, uh, he came out and started talking to us. And, and just as I had suspected, uh, the guy didn't take it very well. I mean, uh, I, we didn't know what he was thinking, but he took it as a missing person report. You know? And the search was done that night more extensively uh, with, with uh, finding nothing. And then for the next four days, a much wider search was carried on uh, with a large number of uh, men, uh, also included horses and, and uh, helicopters. And uh, of course, nothing was, was found of it. But uh, during, during this search, the, uh, the sheriff's department, certain members of, of the <coughs> sheriff's department became more and more certain in their minds that there must have been foul play there rather than the story that we're actually telling. And uh, they uh, finally actually came out and accused us of murder. Uh, 